Hi everyone and welcome to the Changing Tides podcast. In each episode, we invite guests to have honest conversations about their mental health journeys with the goal of destigmatizing mental health within the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Due to the nature of the podcast, we'll be discussing a variety of mental health topics and possibly triggering experiences. While we and the majority of our guests are not trained professionals, we encourage you to practice self-care while listening and seek professional guidance if you or a loved one is in need of support. With that said, let's start the episode. So hello, my name is Carol Long, and I describe my mental health journey um, as messy, grounded, and also ongoing. So all those three words describe my current mental health journey. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Changing Tides podcast. My name is Matthew Yonamura. Uh, welcome back to the podcast if you are a frequenter of the podcast and welcome if this is your first episode. Uh, we're really excited to get into this one, or I am. Uh, admittedly, this was a very difficult conversation. Um, content warning now, uh, we do discuss suicide in this episode pretty extensively. Um, as this person does has done research and they're a professor, uh, but they've done a lot of work in suicide epidemiology and suicide prevention. Uh, we went into this episode knowing that this was going to be a difficult conversation, or at least I knew it was going to be difficult. I have a hard time talking about uh, mental health, even as someone who works for Changing Tides and does this podcast and talks about mental health frequently. Um, Suicide is a very difficult subject for a lot of people to talk about, and um, at the same time, it is a very prevalent issue within the AAPI community and also just mental health as a whole, which we talked about in this episode. So with that said, um, you know, moving forward in this episode, um, please be kind to yourself, take a step back, skip this episode if you need to, Um, but I, I thought this conversation was super valuable. And I hope if you choose to listen to this one that you do too. So with that said, if you choose to listen to this episode, uh, I'm really excited for you to hear the conversation that I had with Carol Lung. There are resources for seeking safe support. You can call 988. This is a suicide and crisis lifeline. Um, It is with the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. You can seek more information on suicidepreventionlifeline.org. You can also call one 800 273 Eight two five five, and that would also direct you uh, to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Again, this is available twenty four hours. Um, we also have a Lifeline chat with a counselor. You can talk um, to counselors on suicidepreventionlifeline.org slash chat, as well as the crisis text line. Um, you can text connect to seven four one seven four one. Again, it's text connect to seven four one seven four one. And this is 24 hour support line and you can text anywhere in the US. Uh, Last, we also have the Trevor Lifeline. The Trevor Project is a leading national organization providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention services uh, to young people under 25 um, to the LGBTQIA plus community. Uh, The number is 1-866-488-7386. Uh, so Carol, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, I remember we did our little CT stream therapist mixer and, uh, I really enjoyed hearing from everyone. And I, what stood out to me was, um, your background in suicide epidemiology and prevention, which is a topic that changing tides is really taking on this year and last year as well. Um, but before we even get into any of that, um, I want to talk about your mental health journey and why you described it the way you did and kind of go from there. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I described it as messy because there's not really like one straight journey. I, I, for me, um, having a lot of transitions in terms of like moving around the U S was a, a big shock for me when I was younger. I am originally from Texas, um, mm-hmm. then moved to New York city, um, and then now I'm stationed in LA. And so that's why I feel more grounded now um, in my, like my, in, in this part of my life now. 
Um, and, and it's always ongoing because as a therapist, I have my own therapist. Um, I still see clients. I, you know, I teach, I also do research and I also see, I have a small caseload, uh, to see clients. So I think the journey is ongoing because not only do my clients teach me, uh, my students teach me, um, and then my own like personal life, um, it's ongoing. And, uh, recently I'm a new mom. Um, it's shaken me up a bit. Um, I have a nine month old. Um, so there's little things such as balancing time, you know, friendships, uh, my own work. It's a new transition for me. Wow. Well, congratulations. I did not know that you're a new mother. So congratulations. Um, there's so many factors of what you've mentioned already that I want to get into. Uh, but I think kind of starting from the beginning and getting an understanding of when you would say your mental health journey began, I think would be a good starting place. Okay. Yeah. So my mental health journey started probably, I would say like 12 or 13 kind of teenage years. Um, I still remember pretty vividly uh, being bullied as a young kid. Um, And it was at camp. It was very subtle. um, But now that I think about it, it really kept me up. Um, I had my first episode of insomnia that occurred. Um, I'm, I think there was a lot of low self-esteem that went on um, and probably a bit depressed, even though not diagnosed. Right. So I did see my pediatrician at, at, at the time and they thought I was bipolar um, mm. and really feeling like stigmatized at the time, provided the wrong medication. Um, and really, it was just an episode for me of like having that low self-esteem and feeling blue um, at that time. Um, and that really like sparked my interest when I got better. Um, I probably got better within like half a semester of school um, seeking um, help. Um, and yeah, that really got me interested in going into psychology, actually, um, and really understanding why how the brain works. So that was the start of my, I guess, mental health journey. Wow. So, so around that time when it started, was this when you were in Texas at the time? Yeah, I went to school in Texas. Um, but it was like a summer camp. Um, hmm. that I had. So it was like new people, new faces, maybe some like old friends, but it was like a new dynamic of creating new friendships. So I, I think for me at such a young age, I wasn't able to understand how to uh, adjust to things. It was like a whole week long as my first time away from home, from my family and um, just didn't know how to deal with change. Um, mm. at such a young age at 11 or 12. Gotcha. So, you know, that's what one, the common thread with this podcast is not only is the, the journey, um, it's the ups and downs, it's messy, uh, but it also, it, it begins at different ages, but, you know, it's not the first time we've heard that it begins at such a young age, um, because, you know, when you hear 12 or 13, like, that sounds really young, because it is a really mm-hmm. young age to be experiencing such intense emotions and such an intense um battles you know so i I'm, I'm wondering so what kind of helped you you know because i think you said it was about a semester later when things started to turn around is that mm-hmm. right Correct. Um, so around that time how what what steps were taken or what helped you um turn things around in your journey yeah, I think a strong social support network was crucial. Like there were some friends that it uh, just left me, you know, mm-hmm. after seeing like um, when I was on the medication, I had act out and acted out in school in terms of like not being all there, I would say, I would describe it. So I had some erratic behavior, odd behavior, um, and people were just a little bit scared of me, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um and they were shocked. And so they weren't my friends anymore. And, and you got to realize this was when you're 12 or you know 13, trying to figure things out. And people are like, oh, I don't want to be associated with this person. Um, so there was a lot of taboo, I believe. Um, right. This over, what, 20 years ago, right? 20, 25 years ago, um, when people didn't really like seek help. And um, psychologists were called shrinks, right? And and it was a very maybe bit, bit derogatory in terms of like, when if you go out and seek help what that means that we have you're crazy or there's something wrong with you, your family there's some genetic things that are 
like associated with what was going on. And so I think from there, I was always really interested, like, oh my gosh, I can't believe like I was usually very put together, made really good grades, had a good amount of friends, but yet like this small incident of a summer camp really just like spun me for a circle um, to see what it, what it had done to me. Gotcha. Um, so I know like your own journey made you more curious about how the mind works and um, wanting to understand like your own experience but were there any other factors that led you to pursue your career in mental health yeah so i started off working um, at asian american family services um, it was one of the probably only organization that targeted um, asian americans and asian immigrants um, and I, I think that really stirred, stirred up like, whoa, like I didn't, I, I knew there was a taboo, but I just didn't know that there was like a center for that. And so I volunteered at probably age 14, 15, doing wow. raffle tape drawings and um, really trying to educate the community, going out to, um, I didn't give workshops, but I was there with the people that were giving workshops and that really intrigued me. I was like, oh my gosh, I want to be like that person. Mm -hmm. um, and so that led me into like psychology in college. Um, later on, um, I'm a social worker. I have a licensed clinical uh, LCSW, LCSW, which is licensed clinical social worker. Um, and I really wanted to work with the community. I think um, social work sets apart with like looking at the social justice framing. Um, and I worked with like undocumented um, students, um, trying to get them um, uh, documentations to be part of society. And that really triggered me to be like, OK, I, I want to help the immigrant population. Um, and then that led me eventually to work as a psychotherapist, um, working uh, with Asian Americans, um, primarily Chinese folks um, in Flushing uh, Hospital out in New York City, um, trying to work with people who have severe mental illness, um, such as schizophrenia, um, maybe even, um, yeah, serious mental illness. Wow. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you don't mind me asking, when it comes to, like, did... Did your family or um, close friends like or other Asian Americans growing up, did they talk about mental health openly or like like how big of a change in direction was this for for you in comparison to the people in your immediate circle? Yeah, I mean, it's wild to see that I was probably the token Asian going mm. in social work. I was literally the voice of the Asian American community when I was in classes. And again, this was in Texas, but UT Austin is quite diverse. Um, but like, yeah, I was shocked that not many people went into this field. Um, now, of course, the vocabulary has changed over the years. People are seeking help. People are like saying, okay, this is you know, we need to seek therapy, like maybe once a month, even, or like every other week. But back then it was not. Um, so for me to go in, I was, again, the, one of the only people that have gone in, and especially in a profession where people think it, it's like not a, like a profession. It's like, oh, you're a professional volunteer. That's what you do. Um, so I think things have changed now um, in terms of how people see mental health and how important it is um, that one like a small episode even can really, um, I guess it, it like high functioning people have can, you know, it's messy for people. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I can only imagine because I, I first was aware, I mean, changing tides was established in 2018 and you know, that's only, wow. I, I was going to say only five years ago, but that time flew by actually which is kind of funny but um you know 2018 it's not that long of a time ago mm -hmm. and it's like even from then to now mental health and the discussion around it has been changed so much and you know i could only imagine especially representation wise for when you're going through this process of pursuing this career i could only imagine what that was like for for you and not even in southern california like mm -hmm. uh where there's a lot more diversity here so I'm just, it's so, I'm so interested in that experience, but uh, along those lines, you know, I, I, you also go, you're also a professor. So what drew you to also being a professor and like teaching folks about the field? Yeah. So I think overall, it's like, I can impact more people because mm. if I teach somebody 
or, you know, guide them, mentor them, they can also serve like another like 50 to 100 people in the next like two, three months. Mm. So I think that gave me like purpose of going into teaching and just seeing um, people who have the passion. I think that also drives me. It's like it's the newness of like the students are so eager to learn. And when you see them pro- pro- like progress each like semester, you're like, whoa, I've, I've like, I've paid it forward in that sense. Mm. And I, I see that when I'm doing teaching. Um, and then with teaching, you also strike balance with doing research too. So you can also implement like policy. So looking at prevention through a policy lens. Um, so you get both the meso and macro um, parts of social work. So um, that really led me into teaching at yeah, the passion for teaching. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, like, it's not hard for to make that connection. I feel like that that seems very obvious, but I'm very glad to hear it from you. You said it so poignantly. Um, so along the lines of not only students, and I'm also curious about clients, but when your career began in mental health to now, mm-hmm. how are students coming in with more awareness of vocabulary than maybe the first year when you first started teaching and then same with clients like are they more aware of mental health and Mm -hmm. does does the way the does the landscape of mental health now and the way it's changed and evolved does it make it easier for you or are there still the same problems or the same difficulties um yeah that's a great question i think starting off with just mental health in the school and education system there are more resources now for students Um, So even in like higher ed, um, there's, yes, there's always been counseling centers, um, but I think there's more like awareness around it. There's more like um, brochures or people are advertising in it. So recently, like we did um, love letters um, at APU at Azusa Pacific University. It's not necessarily, um, it, it was suicide prevention, but it was a way for people to connect with each other. And I think there's more like emphasis on it on like make what does it mean to have healthy relationships and um, healthy minds and healthy healthy bodies. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's more initiatives than say 20 years ago. Um, I will also say like in the curriculum, um, in the teaching curriculum, if you were, I'm just starting um, to teach a certificate on Asian M, um, the Asian American experience, um, we're actually um, adding a mental health component to it. Mm-hmm. So I think it really starts with just the educational piece, right? And even in high schools and middle schools, um, they're adding these components into the curriculum. And so then I think there's more awareness for young adults um, nowadays to say, okay, it's okay to go seek help. It's okay to have somebody to talk to. Whereas back then it was like, what, what is a counselor? You know, what is a therapist? Oh, do you have problems? Like, oh yeah, you must, you know, I'm going to stay away from that person. So yes, the vocabulary has changed. I think within like the three years that I've been teaching, I wouldn't say like much has changed, Mm. but since since 10 years ago, yes. Like um, I think more, at least Asian Americans are seeking counseling. Uh, And especially in the millennial age group too, um, there is not enough Asian American therapists. We run into that over and over again, where people are like, okay, language competency, um, just cultural humility about the Asian American experience is not enough. Like, um, even I guess when I had my first job at Flushing Hospital in Queens, they recruited me all the way from Texas because there was wow. not Asian therapist, even in New York City, where right city is so high for Asians, right? So I think that has been like an issue, an ongoing issue that I've run into. It's like, mm. oh, can you speak Chinese, Mandarin, or Cantonese? And I yeah, I can. Um, but there's not many of us who can um, provide these counseling services for these individuals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that the need for cultural competency in terms of, you know, similar therapists of a similar background is so important. And of course, like any step towards mental health, uh, improving one's mental health is a good step. But I think it makes it a lot easier for folks when they have a similar background. Hence, you know, why we reached out to you to be involved with CT Stream and like why we established that initiative. But um, kind of along the like, you know, the same way we established CT Stream to make it easier for folks to seek therapy, culturally competent therapy. And then, I mean, there's the financial barrier that we removed through that initiative. But 
I actually want to ask about your experience seeking a therapist as a therapist, because I think that you probably have an interesting lens into the way you sought out therapy. So if, if you don't mind me asking, how, what was your process in finding a therapist? What did you prioritize? Because while I'd love for everyone to go through CT Stream, some folks may want to do it through their other means. So do you mind walking through your process of how you... So in my own practice, what I tell my own clients is that, you know, you grow out of your therapist, Hmm. like you learn X amount of tools, and then sometimes you might have to move on. Um, So for me, I, I like work with a certain, uh, I work with my therapist. Um, Sometimes they can be long-term depending on what my core issue is. Um, And then I might move on. So, you know, recently I've had a kid. And so I had seeked out a therapist that was, you know, an expert um, in maternal health and postpartum um, versus my past therapist. I was working on, you know, maybe past traumas for my own family, um, intergenerational traumas. Um, so I, I, I think there is a different lens on like who can, who can best serve you. Um, and having that open conversation with your therapist from the get go, um, is really important. Yeah. Um, I also think to have, sometimes you could have two therapists too, where it's complementary to one each other. One person may be working on one issue, but you might, you know, have a crisis going on and then they can complement um, your other therapist. Although like not everybody has that time. Um, but I have done that in the past and just making it like an open conversation with my, with my therapist, I think is really helpful and makes me a better therapist serving my clients. I maybe I haven't been listening enough, but I don't know if I've heard anyone say that you could outgrow your therapist. I feel like it's always a matter purely of, oh, like personality wise, it didn't fit. But that's such a good point to acknowledge, like there's different expertise and there could two therapists could com- complement one another for one client. Like you just kind of blew my mind when you said that. And I think that's so helpful to hear. We're taking a quick break to introduce Anchor, the sponsor of this podcast. Anchor is free, first and foremost, which is amazing. Who doesn't love free? And you can record everything directly into Anchor. It's so easy to use Anchor. That's how you are listening to this podcast, whether it's Spotify, Apple, the Anchor website. You're listening to it because I uploaded this podcast episode to Anchor. If you want to start your own podcast, I highly recommend Anchor. It's made this whole process so easy. So download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. I want to go back to, you know, CT Stream because I could go on and on and on about the program, about my perspective of it as the program coordinator behind it. But as one of our therapists for CT Stream, which so grateful for you, um, can you please tell us what your experience in that initiative has been like so far? And you won't hurt my feelings. I, I'd love to hear, honestly, what it's been like. Well, first off, shout out to all my clients. Uh, for those who've been listening, um, y'all have been so amazing. And um, you've made this experience, first and foremost, um, so lovely. Um, and I miss those that have not been working with me anymore. Um, everybody has really, truly, um, really been, like, I feel like, I owe it to them because they've shared their narratives and their stories to me. And I'm really touched by so many of the stories that I've heard. Um, and ultimately, like, I really, uh, like, am so grateful for this CT stream because it has helped so many uh, young individuals, young adult individuals transition um, from different life stages. Um, and so, yes, shout out to my clients. Um, so, um I guess what my experiences has been like, um, the staff, you all have been great. Like how you are like screen people, um, and teach them, I think guide them, um, on how to seek a therapist, giving them three options. Not everybody knows this, you know, it's like, Oh, where do I go? Do I go to my insurance panel and like figure this out? Um, do I cold call people? No. And I think giving that education from the get-go will help them in say like five years from now when they need to have a therapist and when they're in crisis, like they're able to walk through a solution for themselves and seek a therapist. Even though that CT stream, the 10 sessions have, have ended, I think their next like big event that they need help with or just have somebody to talk to, they're able to navigate the system. The behavioral health system, I will say there are so many gaps and cracks in there. And some people may fall through those cracks. 
And with CT strain, people are not stigmatized. You know, you don't need to have a diagnosis. People can come with who they are. And I really appreciate that, that um, us therapists don't have to give a diagnosis, but also can educate why we give diagnosis to these individuals so that in the future, they know um, the pros and cons of using insurances. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think I really appreciate that for CT stream. Um, Also, yeah, I mentioned giving like the option and us educating them that it's okay, that there's no hard feelings if you don't use me, right? Or Mm -hmm. you think somebody else specializes in your area and you mesh well with them and it's a good fit, then go with them. So I think that um, even though some people didn't go with me, they found it really helpful just to talk to somebody else that there's always a second or third opinion on the problems you face. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm so glad that I did ask and that we, that was the feedback you gave. I really, I mean, we really appreciate what all the therapists in CT stream are doing. Um, but I think, you know, to hear what you just said is really great to hear because I think a, a hesitancy for some folks, it might be, you know, 10 sessions. Uh, I'm coming in, like, for example, I might be coming in with this experience that I don't know I could tackle in 10 sessions. And that might be very true, you know, maybe it is a, something that is a long-term therapy process, but, you know... But short-term versus long-term therapy, you know, 10, 10 sessions through CT stream isn't quite a lifelong therapist. But how, how are those two long-term versus short-term? How, how do you maybe approach it differently as the therapist? Um, so for the short-term, at least telling them in the beginning, this is short-term, this is solution focus, or just the, the techniques I use um, so that they, they know that after 10 sessions, this could be the end. Um, but also opening up even for us too, to think about when you're a young adult, like paying for therapy for like, say one in 50 is a lot of money, right? So being able to be flexible with this client so there's that they can transition if maybe it's like, okay, you're charging 150. Is there a way we can like offer other resources if it's a cheaper way, or you can like stay on with them for a little bit longer until they can find something. Um, I think that is important. Um, did that answer the question? Yeah, yeah, totally. I, I, you know, again, I think your approach as one of our many therapists in CT stream doesn't necessarily have to reflect everyone's. And I, I just think it's good to know, like, for people that, you know, therapy, especially for first time therapy goers, therapy is like so maybe different from what is perceived in terms of the media or like a TV show and how therapy is like depicted, right? right. So I think just like people may not even realize, oh, short term versus long term therapy. I haven't even thought about that being a difference or needing to approach that differently, you know? So. Well- yeah, I guess long term and short term. Yeah. So I because this CT stream, it's like 10 sessions. I also tell them like you can have a pause and reflect. Right. Mm. You can come back to me later on and we'll like we'll still open the case back up. Mm. Um, and sometimes like even for me, like when I see my therapist every two weeks, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is too much. Like I just need like a break. I need to like get my thoughts together. I need to like process what happened. Um, sometimes therapy might be like a little slower because like you need a week or two before you see your therapist or even a month. Right. So I think sometimes that gap and that break allows room for somebody to maybe seek long-term therapy. Like, okay, this is what I see right now. Um, I'm going to take a break and then I I can seek long-term. I I think this is like a good, like, it's a good transition for them. It's like a good starter kit. Yeah. Um, um, and then they could say, okay, maybe therapy is not for me or, oh, wow, I can stop. I have the self-determination to stop when I want to stop. And when mm. if I want to go again, I can go again. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that uh, added part of how the two might differ. Um, so as I mentioned earlier on, um, in working with you at CT Stream and our, our therapist mixer that we want to do again, uh, but I learned that you have done a lot of work in suicide epidemi- epidemiology and prevention. Uh, can you share, you know, what inspired you to go specifically with that direction? Yeah. So um, I 
this is hard to talk about because I have been affected by suicide. Um, one of my own personal clients um, had died by suicide. Um, and I was quite young at the time, I think early 20s. Um, I just my first job coming out. And um, I just felt so guilty um, that I just felt like I didn't do enough. Um, and, and, you know, as I reflect on it, I'm like, you know, I did as much as I could, um, but it wasn't, and it wasn't enough. Right. So I decided, okay, I got to change policy in a certain, in a certain way. And how do I do that? And how, how can I make an intervention where it affects more people? Um, and so that's how I ended up going into like research and academia and studying suicide prevention. It's because that, you know, I, I'm on a, going out through a downstream approach. You know, I'm saving everybody, trying to save everybody. But, you know, at the end of the day, you might not be able to because big, bigger things such as policies play a bigger role in some um, in population based uh, research. So that got me um, into studying um, suicide. Got it. Uh, thank you so much for sharing, you know, your personal experience with it. It's through working in mental health. I mean, just through changing tides, you realize how widely impactful um, suicide is in the API community, in the individuals affected, and the work that is done in understanding it and understanding that it might not be like what like it that feeling that you had right of uh, mm -hmm. that you didn't do enough uh i think kind of removing that is important in understanding the epidemiology right mm -hmm. so if we can start with the epidemiology of suicide can you talk about what you've found there in, in your research so recently suicide uh, was well suicide is actually the tenth leading cause of death um, in our country right now um, but suicidologists actually believe it's the 11th leading cause of death uh, because there are um un, I guess what is it called it's undisclosed um, suicide maybe somebody dies of overdose um uh, they there might be taboos about putting this person as suicide. Um, so families maybe say, oh, this wasn't, a, this was not a suicide. You know, it was a taboo subject. This person died of like an accident. Um, and so that's why we as a suicidologists think it's like the 11th cause of uh, leading, uh, leading cause of death. And recently it has moved up um, to the 12th leading cause because of COVID-19 um, and other liver um, problems. So that's mm -hmm. why it's, it used it for like 10, 20 years, it was like the 10th leading cause of death. Um, there has been a steady increase in suicide since 2000, 2000 um, but there's a dip, um, like a reduced rate of suicide starting uh, during COVID-19. And we actually mm -hmm. don't know the reasons why. Uh, maybe COVID-19 was a protective factor in the very beginning, um, but now suicide rates have been going up again, steadily. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been probably the highest since um, 2000. Wow. Um, and particularly for me, I examine uh, the differences between males and females on um, choice of methods. So we say that the choice of methods matter. Um, we know that gun suicides um, are 50%, at least 50%, make up 50% of suicide deaths. Mm -hmm. um, so meaning that means do matters. Um, so this is part of gun violence. Um, suicide is part of gun violence. Um, we see also that uh, women, um, when we look at men and women, what men, we know that they use firearms um, to kill themselves. But women, actually, it is that, well, the choice of method, women actually use it, also firearms as well. People have a myth of like, oh, it's it's overdose or suffocation. But no, it is now women, 30%, 33% um, use firearms of, as of 2021 20, from the CDC data. So we're, we're like two years or two years behind in data, um, but that is a new discovery um, for that firearms are the most important method. So from epidemiology, when it comes to understanding the causation and the different causations between gender, how does that kind of translate in maybe how we approach prevention mm -hmm. and what have you found in the research and prevention of suicide? 
Um, so how do we, per, how can we translate it to prevention? I think first and foremost is thinking about methods, um, that the choice of method does matter in this country. Um, so if someone has a gun in their home, they're more likely to die by suicide. Hmm. Um, and it is the most commonly method used, right? So, um, if you break it up for female men, females will use it. A third of them will use a gun. Males is around 50%, right? Um, so how we can prevent it is ultimately to reduce access to lethal me methods, right? To um, maybe have some kind of um, sensible gun policies where if somebody is suicidal, um, there is a, a temporary removal of guns. Not saying we're taking away firearms, just a temporary removal. The guns will be going back to the individual um, once they're not suicidal anymore. And I think that can prevent um um, suicides. And in California, we do have um, that law. Um, in other states, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of states can actually use California as a model um, to prevent um, more firearm uh, related suicides. Yeah. Um, also, I think number two is actually talking to the family members. I don't think it's just the person because when someone is suicidal, um, it's not just that, you know, it's really hard for people to seek help when they're suicidal. I think sometimes talking to family members, especially in the AAPI community, when people don't know where to receive help, um, talking to the family members, like, what is your concern about this individual or your family member, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your best friend, even. Um, it's talking to the support system and actually giving support to those individuals. Because it's a very, very scary situation when someone tells somebody like, oh my gosh, like someone is suicidal. What the heck do I do? Like, I don't know. Do I like, again, like how do they navigate the mental health care system? Um, so I think the support system is where therapists should actually give more support to these mm -hmm. individuals on how to give resources, lead them to like appropriate places, because sometimes hospitals, even though it's a, 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 the 5150 hold, sometimes it's a gray area of whether or not to send somebody there, because it could be actually more detrimental to the individual if they had a traumatic experience um, with the mental health um, hospital systems. So I think helping the family members and support system, especially at their breaking point of feeling helpless. Um, that's where a lot of the intervention does play a role. And my research, actually, I've looked at suicide concerns um, for family members, and they say that, like, um, I need help. I, I, I need resources. Where do I go? Hmm. So I know there's multiple different ways to go with that in terms of, you know, family members or friends or family seeking ways to help like how do i help like where if i were to come to you at, and ask you like i'm concerned like where where should i go or what's the first step because can i trust anything on google or you know like like what what would you recommend hmm. um i think first and foremost it's like to listen to the individual first because I, I was saying like, it's scary to like navigate it, to hear about it. And, and like, oh, like it could be your fault that this person dies because you weren't able to help them. So I think first and foremost is to listen to that um, support system. What do they need? Of course, like remove all the lethal methods, like making sure there's no sharp objects, um, making sure that somebody's there with that individual um, and then giving them the resources of like, okay, which hospital, what to expect. I think what to expect is really important because when somebody gets thrown in, it's like, whoa, you have to take this medication. Like it's trial and error in, in the hospitals. Um, I mean, this is, it could be right. It could be an example. And so people may be like, oh, I, I don't want to go. Um, and so the involuntary, um, admission, I think is scary for that person who is going through, um, a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. So I think first and most prevention should be sitting down with that individual and then providing the resources for, um, the support system and then bringing in that individual who has a crisis that, and then you have a, a a family session, um, yeah, a family session with the individual. Gotcha. So I, I so much appreciate you sharing um, your work in this space because I, you know, in this conversation, despite the work that Changing Tides is doing within suicide prevention through CT Anchor, talking about suicide is still difficult for me and it's difficult for so many people. 
So I just appreciate that there is there are people like you doing the research and having the understanding and being, you know, a therapist that is able to help people in with their mental health. So um, I appreciate you having this conversation. Um, oh, can I add one thing too? Please do. Uh, please do. Or therapists too, to just a word of encouragement that, you know, even feeling suicidal is a feeling and not being able to talk about that feeling in session um, is something it takes practice. Um, it takes courage, it takes bravery to be in that space. And you're also receiving that from your client, um, that that journey is part of their messy journey. They're part of their um uneasiness or feeling a bit like they they're, they're trusting you essentially to tell you that side and so mm -hmm. when someone is telling you that they're suicidal you know just sit with them and you know it, it really that therapist it like we sometimes therapists like freak out like oh my gosh someone's gonna tell me that they're suicidal I, I encourage them to sit with them and then go with the plan um, of like suicidal planning and then finding resources for the individual yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think that's, I mean, of course, like for the common person who's not a therapist, they may not be able to do those exact steps, but I, that's still a similar framework that one could utilize, right? Like, I think one thing that we've learned through QPR, which is the suicide prevention group that we work with for CT Anchor, mm. is the being able to sit with someone and ask those questions of how they're feeling and what they need. And then that's that, that's kind of the first step. Like, what you it's kind of a similar approach for for anyone. I would feel like, right? Or yeah. do you think it is a little different? Or I think it's the same, really. It's okay. being uncom being comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? Um, and being there and like dropping everything to like be with that person, no matter if you're a therapist or a, just an individual helping a friend out. Um, I, it. I just, yeah, it's, it's scary, but when that person who was in a mental health crisis looked back what had happened, it's like, whoa, like there was somebody that really understood me, could empathize with me and really like held my hand through it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is a really important piece when someone's going through turmoil. Right. Um, so Carol, thank you again. Uh, I have some quick questions for like just silly get to know you but before that uh is there anything else you'd like to add or anything that we didn't touch on that you'd like to say before you to get to there um i just really love ct stream it's been it's just been such an amazing experience and um yeah, I hope you have more mixers um uh, so that everybody can like get to know each other but it's been a wonderful experience and i've really enjoyed it Good. Thank you so much. And yes, we are working on another mixer. So uh, we might even have information by the time this episode is out, but okay. we'll let you know. Okay. Um, so we do have some just fun ones to ask you. Um, I'd like to start with asking, what's a skill that you don't have but wish you did have? Mm. Um, I wish I could drive a race car. Uh, <laughs> go to Formula One and be able to like, you know, race in a car. I wish I had that skill, but I don't. I can watch it on TV. So, so are you like an adrenaline junkie? Say so. I, I had my, my my partner and I we climb. We did climb, and so I was actually scared of heights, and so I I want to like you know face those fears. Wow. Um, so I think with driving a fast car, that is, I don't know, it's just oh yeah. <laughs> I I I cannot say I have the the racing. A racing bone in my body nor that do i want one but maybe we'll see you out on the uh, the track someday and you'll yeah. be uh we'll, we'll be able to watch you from from the tv <laughs> <laughs> um when you find free time outside of your numerous professions including being a mother because that's i don't know how you're balancing all your your work duties and then your your mom duties but how do you decompress or relax when you have yeah. all that going on um i love surfing hmm. um surfing there that grounds me in many aspects and i'm a longboarder so i like dancing on the board and it's a way for my meditation and um seeing the waves and the ocean come at me 
there's something larger out there, I think. And that calms me down um, because, yeah, I feel like my troubles go away when I hear the waves and um, catch a great one and be next to dolphins sometimes. That's awesome. I, I, you know, I wonder, and I, I'm just curious on the topic of surfing being a meditation thing for you. But do you have a bad day of surfing? Does that still, is that still grounding or is it, does that add to uh, frustrations? Because for me, like um, lifting weights or basketball, if I have a bad day of basketball, when I usually love it, I, like, I, I, I still enjoy getting out there. So I'm wondering how it works for you. Well, it sucks that I'm like, my hair is wet. I have to like clean up the same <laughs> everywhere and I have to re-wax my board. Yeah. But it's like, okay, life's messy. Right. Um, um, and so I think it reminds me that, you know, there, there, there are bad days. <laughs> and yeah. so the ocean reminds me of that too. Like it's not all happy and rainbows and a dolphin next to you or a seal next to you. Um, so it, it, it is part of the experience and it, it also reflects again, my mental health journey. Mm. I totally get that. And I was just curious because I know for sometimes, like when that's like your thing and it is not going well, that could be like the most frustrating thing. But I, I'm along the same the same uh boat as you. Like it's still part of it, you know. I still it still does something for my decompression. Definitely. But I wish um, I could catch like a really awesome wave that day. Just, <laughs> right. Oh, did it. It's still in the back of your head a little bit. Like, but oh. yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I might know the question, the answer to this question now, uh, if you weren't a therapist or a professor, what career path would you explore? Would it be a, a surfer or? I mean, no, I'm not good enough to be a professional <laughs> surfer. <laughs> I mean, I've always wanted to be an elementary school teacher. Mm. Uh, yeah. I think that kind of also led me into like teaching. Cause I, I think at age, like six or seven I was like I want to be a teacher and then I forgot about it and then uh -huh. I'm like oh, yeah I remember that like yeah I did want to be a teacher an elementary school teacher but that's why I can also be a child therapist um yeah, as well. yeah. Or, do you have a preferred grade that you think you'd like to teach or do you just as a whole I think you, second grade because I remember during those times did you ever make those like books like you made books you drew pictures you wrote like poems and then you yeah did that but um in Texas, we did that and we bind books. And that was like one of my highlights in grade school. So second grade. Awesome. Awesome. Um, then finally, uh, what would the title of your autobiography be? Autobiography. Oh, my goodness. I don't, like, I don't know. I'm trying to think of a autobiography I don't know this question this one's a hard one it's tough it's tough um, oh gosh I just, like I don't want to sound corny and I don't want to, I don't know I'm like trying to think about it um you know maybe moving along I guess moving along Hey, and you know what? That that child could change. This isn't binding you to your book deal, so don't worry about it too much. You know, that's this is just for fun. But um, no, I I like it. I like it personally. I, I don't think you need to worry about like, it. I don't know. I don't want to. <laughs> I know Harry um, had like spare or something. I was like, I don't know if I love that title. And I was like, oh, what would my title be? I don't know. <laughs> I, I like it. I like what it. Would you, what would yours be? I think what I said when I was asked this was listen, learn, grow, which is something that like for some reason that's always stuck with me. Like I think those are like the three big steps in evolving as a person. Okay. Like you, you just have to be able – being a willing listener I think is a big step okay. in evolution as a person. So I think that's where I'd go with it. Okay. Great yeah. autobiography title. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, but Carol, thank you so much again. Uh, I just want to emphasize that th I know, like, regardless of my background in changing tides, like speaking about mental health is still so challenging. And I appreciate you for having that conversation with me. And hopefully, um, it just puts the idea out there for folks to 
just reach out to people, you know, making sure you're checking in with your loved ones. I think that's kind of another first step with this all is checking in with people. So I appreciate you so much for having this difficult conversation with me and for doing the important work that you do. And um, I'll see you at the next Therapist Mixer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you again to Carol for joining me on the podcast and discussing her research in suicide epidemiology, her being on CT Stream and being a great therapist that we get to work with, and then also just her approach to being a therapist in general. Um, I think it's so valuable to hear from a mental health professional on our podcast. Uh, It's also valuable to hear from our other guests, but uh, it's just great to add a professional lens into the mix with all of our other great guests. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Uh, If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe to our show for episodes that release every other Tuesday and give us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. If you would like to support our podcast and to help us grow, you can do so with a donation to the link at the bottom of the episode description. To hear more about Changing Tides, follow us on Instagram at LTSC underscore Changing Tides or check out our website, thechangingtides.org. Let's continue to change the tide on mental health. We got it. We